for joining us for our time of worship today. Um, if you came in a little bit later, you're like, wait a minute, I thought this was Cornerstone. Well, it is. Uh, we're starting a new series today called Beyond the Building, and uh, you're invited right into our living room. And so we're at my house today, uh, and we are gathered here together with praise team, uh, a few people uh, helping with the sound and video stuff, and we just kind of kept it small today. Um, but we are excited about uh, this message. We're excited about this series. We're excited about what God can teach us through His Word. So uh, I just want to thank you for joining in. If this is your first time listening to us and joining in, uh, would you go to mycornerstone.fyi? And if you do that, um, mycornerstone.fyi, that's a place you can fill out a connection card. And you can join in and and actually and and fill that out and let us get to know you a little bit. You can also share about needs in the community. We added that this week. If you know of a need in the community, you know of something that needs to be done, go there. Do that. Uh, you can also share prayer requests. Kind of stay connected. This morning, the church has left the building. Um, and we're changing things up uh, quite a bit for this series. I looked up in the dictionary this week, and this was interesting. Um, what, and I just looked up what, how the dictionary defines the word church. Um, and it was the dictionary definition of church is this. It's um, a building used for public Christian worship. Now, I think for us as Christians, we know that, well, there's some problems with that definition. Uh, church is much more than just a building. Um, and many people to, today, though, understand the church as a building. That's when they think about church, that's what they think about. But that's not the biblical understanding of the word church. The word church is actually a translation of the Greek, Greek word ekklesia. Um, and so that's a word that maybe you've heard before. Uh, it literally means an assembly or the called out one. So it's people who have been called out and who are gathering together. Uh, the root meaning of church is not that of a building but of people. And so it's ironic that when you ask people about church, their first thought is about buildings. Um, in fact, if we look in the New Testament in Romans 16, and Paul says, greet the church that is in their house. And so he says, greet, think about that for a minute, just the church that's in uh, the, their house. I mean, that's, that's the, the way the early church started was from house to house and they were being persecuted. So that's really the only way they could meet is by meeting house to house. Um, and so we, when we realize that, we realize real quickly that we are the church. And so even though we can't gather together in our building, uh, today we are the church. We may be scattered uh, around the Twin County area, uh, but we're still the church today. Um, and so we can gather together to worship and to learn from God's Word. Now, just a few weeks ago, it's, it, it's this whole past month has been so crazy. But March 7th through March 14th, I was in Nicaragua doing pastor training. And that was the week that everything started getting a little crazy here. And so we were in Nicaragua, at very limited Internet the first part of the week. And then we started kind of hearing, hey, there's starting to be travel restrictions and things are starting to shut down and. And there's starting to be an outbreak, and at the time it was Seattle, and uh, all this stuff that was happening, and uh, we were trying to kind of keep track of it, and I flew back late that Saturday night, and it was kind of crazy coming back through the airport in Atlanta and through Charlotte, and we went ahead and had church on the 15th. Uh, looking back, it probably wasn't the best idea at the time, but we were all just trying to still figure out what was going on, but luckily, thankfully... Um, uh, we, you know, we didn't have any problems, but um, we started then, of course, all the restrictions started happening, the stay at home orders, the limiting of public gatherings. And and so for us as a church, we had to kind of step back and say, OK, now what? What are we going to do and how is this going to affect us? And we were really in the same boat that every other church was in. Um, and, and so what would could we even keep having church and what would it look like? And can we do it online? And would anyone watch and would people stay connected and would continue, would people continue to support the church financially? Would our groups be able to keep meeting? All these questions are kind of going through our head a little bit. And so uh, really the, the scary part is realizing, Hey, we're going to be separated for a while. 
And uh, when we think about that, we're not created for isolation. We're created to live in community. And so today, that's really what I want to talk about. How how do we move forward? How do we, because we really don't have the answers. We don't know when we're going to start meeting together again. We don't know what it looks like when we start kind of gradually uh, kind of easing the restrictions and what's church going to look like the rest of this year and next year. There's a lot of unknowns. And, and so here, if you're following along today and, and taking notes, here's the first point that I want to share with you. I think right now we're in a time where people are searching for hope. Uh, people really are. They're just searching for hope. Uh, they're looking for answers. They're looking for, uh, they, they, they're just not sure about uh, this world we live in. And, and in times of trouble, trouble, people need comfort. They need assurance. They need, uh, they need answers to life's tough problems. Uh, do you guys, do you remember uh, like where you were and what was happening when 9-11 happened? Most everyone does. Well, Luke and Philip probably don't. Uh, Luke was a year old, and yeah, that makes me feel a little old. And you weren't that much older. Drew wasn't even born yet. Um, so, but for most of us, we really remember what happened uh, on that day of nine nine eleven. And when that all happened and that took place, what we saw as a nation is everybody really was looking for answers. They were looking for hope. Uh, I remember Billy Graham speaking in in, in New York. I remember um, everybody uh, just was so, I mean, the churches were packed for a while. Uh, and I remember Jennifer and I were doing youth ministry at the, at the time. And I remember the youth asking, you know, all sorts of questions. There were a lot of fear, a lot of emotions that people were struggling through. Um, and so all of churches just all over the country were full. Why? Because people needed hope. And I feel like we're in a similar time right now, that people need hope. People need to, to learn uh, about God. And, and so maybe you're in that place today. You're looking for answers. You're looking for hope. Maybe you've just stumbled across this uh, live stream in your Facebook feed today. I urge you to keep watching, to keep listening, because I believe God has a word for you today. Um, if you uh, have your Bibles with you, let's look to Hebrews chapter 10. That's my main passage for today. Um, Hebrews chapter 10. And on Hebrews chapter 10, um, uh, this is a passage that I, I think is so, uh, man, just so, it, it just really speaks to us where we are today. And this is what it says, starting in verse 23 through verse 25. It says, let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm. For God can be trusted to keep his promise. And let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. And let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. Uh, man, what, what a passage for us today. And this is really a passage about how we find hope. Now, this is really a passage about what do we do as a as the church and not again not the building but the people. Um, and so what we see here that we really find hope in a couple of ways. One, we find hope in God's faithfulness. That's the next point that we find hope in God's faithfulness. Um, and so when we look at how God has been faithful in our past, it gives us hope for our future. Uh, we tend to think we're blessed when things in our life are going well. I think that's for me anyway. That's kind of when things in my life are going great, when things are turning out the 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 way that that we want them to, then we're excited. We we think, oh man, God is blessing my life. But when things don't turn out the way we plan, then instead of feeling blessed, uh, we feel almost cursed. <laughs> we feel like God's turned his back on us. We're like, God, where are you? Why is this ha- why is this even happening to me? And, and I think that's a that's a problem because we only think. Uh, the way we kind of interpret uh, events going on around us is God blesses us when things turn out for good for me. But when things don't turn out for good for me, then he's not blessing. me, And that's really not the truth at all, because we know that in life there will be times where we're on that mountain peak when things are going great. And there's also going to be times when we're kind of in that valley when we're struggling. It doesn't mean that God is not blessing us or that he's not speaking to us or that he's not using those circumstances to form us to be more like Christ. 
Uh, in fact, when we suffer is, is really uh, the times when we're most like Jesus because we experience what he went through for us. And, and so when I'm hurting, uh, I kind of look for God to deliver me from my pain, but often God wants to deliver me through that pain. He wants to take that experience. He wants to take that and, and use it to, to help me to be more like Christ. And so something, um, you know, when we think about that and we look back to see how God has brought us through situation after situation, and we look in our past and see how He has been faithful it, to go through our struggles today. Um, I don't know about you guys, but one thing that has kind of surprised me a little bit, and I've had several conversations with people about this, is that through this whole current crisis, the older generation, and those that are a little bit older than me, um, or quite a bit older than me, um, they seem to kind of be the most calm through this. And, and talking to some of them, um, it, it's interesting. They're say, they, they say, well, back in 1950, there was a polio outbreak. Have you heard about the polio outbreak in Whitfield and, and what happened? And, and they'll say, well, we made it through that. We just didn't leave our homes much and we had to be really careful. And then they'll then they, they say, well, but you, you know, in World War II, times were tough. And, and, and they've got a perspective. And what that perspective comes from is they've seen how God has been faithful. They look back in their past and say, well, we made it through that. We're going to be fine this time. And sometimes I think we lack that a little bit. We lack that bigger perspective to see, okay, that God is, has, God is carrying us through that uh, and, and our past, and He's still with us today. So why do we have to worry? Why do we have to be afraid? Because God is faithful. And, and that really gives us hope. And, and, and so this passage begins with that command that sounds impossible. Let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm. For God can be trusted to keep His promises. And so when we think about that, and we think about the many promises God has made us through His Word, man, that, that, that just to me, that, that's what gives us hope. That means we don't have to live in fear. That means we don't have to worry that whatever happens, hey, God is still God. God is still on the throne. God is sovereign. We can trust Him even when life doesn't turn out the way we want it to or the way we expect it to. And so we can, we can find hope in God's faithfulness. But we can also find hope. This passage goes on to explain how we can find hope in Christian community. And, and so in Christian community, in church, uh, with our other believers. And so it, to, to talk about this, we need to unpack that word church a little bit more because it can mean a lot of things. In the New Testament, I mentioned earlier that this is a word, the ecclesia, it never refers to a building or a place, and it always refers to a people. Um, and so it's either the total number of believers that have ever lived, or it's a local group of those believers. And so that's kind of what we see, the big C church and the little C church, right? The big C church is every Christian that has ever lived, and the little C church is kind of the local uh, body of believers. And so usually in Scripture, it's referred to as the believers in Corinth, or the, the believers in uh, wherever it was, and the Christians in Berea or in Antioch. And, and so we, we, we find out about these Christians in a city, and that, that was the local church. And so again, it, it's never referred to as a building. Um, in Ephesians 1, Paul says that Jesus is the head over everything for the church. And he's talking about the overall believers. But in Acts 11, uh, he talks about the church in Jerusalem. And so he's talking about a specific group of people. So when we understand that, it kind of helps us to understand a little bit um, uh, the, the challenges that we're facing and how we can find hope. We find hope because we can join in uh, with believers all around the world, but we also are joining in with our believers in our local community. And so really, when we kind of boil it down, a simple church is just a, a spiritual family where Jesus is, uh, is their king. He's at the center of everything they do. It's just a spiritual family. So gathered here today, this is Christian community. This is a, a spiritual family that we have together. Everyone watching in, you're part of our spiritual family as well, if you know Jesus. And so then when groups of these kind of simple churches connect to do something bigger together, that's kind of the regional church. That's kind of the, our local church. That's why we come together and work with other churches right here in our own community. And then 
uh, we can kind of stretch out and continue to serve and do ministry. I, I like what Mark Batterson says about the church. And uh, this is in one of the books he wrote. He said this. He said, a church that stays within its four walls is not a church at all. And man, there's so much truth there. Um, and he says, you can't go to church because you are the church. Uh, he, he says, uh, he went on, went on to say, he said, we believe that your job is your pulpit, that your colleagues are your congregation. Think about that for a minute. Uh, is that really how you view your everyday life? That my... My job is uh, my, my, my job is my pulpit. My job is my opportunity to speak hope wherever I'm at, that my colleagues are my congregation. That's really what church is about. It, it's not the building. It's not what happens for one hour on Sunday morning. It's what happens every day of the week as we go out into the world and we share hope. Um, he went on to talk about this, that, you know, uh, he said, this isn't about a religious duty each weekend. It's about living out faith Monday through Friday. He said we should position ourselves to thrive in the middle of the marketplace. He says we've got to be the most creative place on earth. And he says what gets us up in the morning is the fact that there are ways of doing church that no one has thought of yet. He says if you want to reach people that no one is reaching, you have to do things that no one is doing. Uh, Just think about that for a minute with me. That this, uh, all this crisis that we're going through, it's got some benefit to it. It's forcing us to be creative. It's making us think about new ways of doing things. It's helping us really think about how we can we can reach out and we can make a difference and how we can reach people that probably weren't maybe being reached before. It's forced us to be creative. And anytime we have a lack of resources, anytime we are kind of put in a uh, in, in a kind of a, a tough time, it forces us to think about that. It forces us to think about how we can be creative. And so church is really this launching pad that when we come together, we prepare you to blast off and to go into the world uh, and, and to, to, to use your gifts and to use your uh, the, the opportunities that you have to share hope. Uh, and that's really what it talks about here in this Hebrews passage. And so he says, uh, you know, we've already talked about how we see how God keeps his promises and how that brings us hope. And then he says in verse 24, How do we find hope in Christian community? It's through encouragement. He says, let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. Man, I love this verse. This is what gets me pumped up. Um, When you start thinking about how people can motivate each other to do good things, um, to to really to love and to serve and to share. And, And it's almost like, have you sensed that before that people feed off of each other? And so if you're a church and everybody's always complaining, it's contagious. And people just start complaining about everything. Well, I can't believe they did that. And why did they do that? And why don't we do this? And somebody needs to be doing that. And everything is just being, it's just contagious. But at the same time, when people start doing great things for God, it's contagious as well. People say, man, did you hear about what that person did? That's great. That's such a good idea. I want to try something like that in my workplace. Oh, did you hear that so-and-so accepted Christ? Man, that makes me so happy. I've been praying for them. I need to keep praying. I'm going to reach out and I'm going to share uh, about Christ with my neighbor. It's the same type of thing. And when we come together, what we're doing, we're motivating one another to acts of love and good works. And so when we gather on Sunday mornings, when you're listening, whether it's online or, uh, you know, when we come together, this is motivation for us. This is like our pep rally that prepares us for the week. We get our dose of scripture. We get our encouragement from gathering together. Uh, And then we use that to motivate us to continue serving God all week long. Now, yes, we need to be in his word. We need to be feeding ourselves. And uh, but when we come together, there's just there's nothing that can replace that motivation that we get from one another. And so that that really does excite me that when we come together, man, we get to hear about what how God is moving. And again, let's talk about the, the, the not just the group of believers at Cornerstone. We, we get motivated from seeing what God is doing through all our local churches. So it's not a competition. It's not like when something good happens in another church, we get jealous and say, I can't believe God did that or they're getting blessed or they're growing. Or so. No, we're excited because what? We're motivating each other to acts of love and good works. 
And so these two things are really the, the marks of true Christianity. Is your life full of love and good works? Is your life, I mean, that's really, if you, if you think about that, I mean, when uh, we, we said we, we're known, they will know that you are disciples by your love. Um, Ephesians 2.10, where it says, you know, we're saved by grace through faith. It's not by works, right? For, for God, uh, He prepared all these good works for us in advance to do. Because we are His masterpiece, His prized possession. And He created us to do good works. And so love and good works, these two things kind of go hand in hand. Um, it's interesting to me that so many churches are set up so that people attend on Sunday but really the pastor is expected to, to do everything. Um, and, and it's almost like we pay the pastor to do ministry. And, I, and I've, unfortunately, I've seen that quite a bit. I'm thankful that Cornerstone's not like that. Uh, we take Ephesians 4 pretty seriously, where it talks about how the leaders, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the priests, the teachers, our job is to uh, prepare, you know, it's to equip people for the works uh for the for works, so, you know, it's to equip the saints for the work of ministry. Um, and what that means is my job is to be, uh, I, I, if you you know you have your title like chief executive officer. My my title is the chief motivating officer, right? Uh, that's really what a pastor does. I'm there to motivate you to do love and good works. And so as a pastor, that's what I, I need to be doing: equipping you, and preparing you, and training you, giving you opportunities. Uh, to, to, to do that. And so when you think about it that way, that's really how a church functions. Um, and, and so, you know, I've heard it said, man, you, sh you should be in church every time the door is open. Well, this has kind of made us rethink that a little bit, right? Um, and the truth is that's not really a good thing anyway, because if you're always in the church, who's in the world going and sharing hope, <laughs> right? We need to be going out and sharing. And and some churches are so busy doing stuff that people never get to serve. And, and so at Cornerstone, we, we believe fully that this is an incredible opportunity that God has placed and given us and prepared us for. That now, even though we're not meeting on Sunday morning, this is, this is what the church is all about. We've been preparing for this. We've been training for this. This is the time for the, the Christians in our community to shine. This is the time for us to leave the building and, and to serve and to do acts of love and good works. And, and God has been preparing us for this time after time after time and, and message after message we've heard, scripture after scripture that we've read have kind of brought us back to this is, this is what the church is all about. And so um, I love seeing ways that people are thinking of to, to be the church. And even this week we've I've uh, been able to, to be a blessing to, to quite a few different people through providing meals and cupcakes and cookies to, to doctor's offices and pharmacies and stores. And uh, we're just going out of our way to try to show people that they're appreciated, to share hope in a time when people need it. Uh, we're even talking about our community meal coming up. And it's going to look a little different this month, but we are going to do something for our community meal. And so it's kind of going to be a drive through and we're, we're going we're gonna to need some help preparing meals for that. Um, and so uh, if you will watch our Facebook page and website this week, you'll see some details on how we can do that. But what are other ways that we can serve our community? Um, and maybe you just thought of something or God's put something on your mind. We actually did a, a, a kind of a Zoom call earlier this week, and we uh, got quite a few people together just to brainstorm ideas and talk about ways that we can be the church. And and if you've got an idea and you want to share it, go to mycornerstone.fyi and let us know. And just let us know right where it says, you know, uh, you know, think about how we can serve one another. Go ahead and put it in right there and let us know what are what's your idea? Um, how can we work together? And so that's one of the ways um, that we get encouragement is, is we do it. We find hope and community through that encouragement, through that motivation for one another. But we also find that hope in Christian community through meeting together. And this is what we see in verse 25. Uh, and it says, And let us not neglect our meeting together, as some people do, but let's encourage one another, especially now that the day of His return is drawing near. Now it says that we don't neglect to meet together, and that, that's important, but we encourage one another. 
And, and so now you may be saying, but we're not meeting together. And, and I would argue that we are. Just because we're not in person doesn't mean we're not meeting. Right. Uh, and I know that we miss some things by not being in person. I know you don't get to to see face to face. and Hey, how are you doing? How are things going? Uh, but it's amazing that we have the technology to stay connected. And, and so I'm thankful that we can continue functioning as the church, even when we're not physically meeting together. And so it's just, uh, you know, there's going to uh, these we need to think about the times we get together. Are they encouraging? Are, do they speak truth and do they speak life and do they help you? Uh, do they build you up? Do they edify you know you and and do they bring correction and and, and do, do when we gather together all these things happen why so that we can be more like Christ and I would say we're never more like Christ than when we're serving when you think about Jesus and and he, he's with his disciples one last time and the the example that he wants to leave with them is when he wraps the towel he bends around his waist he bends down and washes the disciples' feet. Uh, that's why we're never more like Jesus than when we're serving, when we're working together. And so um, I, I saw this little uh, I saw this story, uh, and it made me chuckle a little bit. And it was a little boy was with his dad. He, they were walking through a church building, and they found this plaque on the wall and this little memorial. And his dad said, oh, son, that's for everyone who died in the service. And his little son looked up and said, was that the first service or the second service? So I know that was bad. It was a dad job. I can't, couldn't help. Okay. There's something about when we come together, right? Um, when we come together. Uh, there, there's 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 joy there, um, and, and and it shouldn't be a, a church where we're like, man, I, I just uh, I, I can't, I just couldn't, I was just it was all I could do to stay away. No, I mean we should be the the most happy, the most joyful, the most encouraging bunch of people to be around, and and so even when times are tough, we can have joy, and, and so and it says that that we. You know, we not neglect meeting together. We encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. And I would just say this to you, right? If we look at this world around us, um, I think Jesus is coming back. I don't know when, but it could happen anytime, right? We need to prepare ourselves. We need to be ready. And as we look at, Famines, we look at disease, we look at wars, we look at the craziness and the politics all around us. Uh, I'm just, I'm, I'm thinking Jesus is coming back. And, and again, we can't predict when, um, but it could be tomorrow, it could be next year, it could be a thousand years from now, but it doesn't matter. We're to be ready no matter when he comes back. Um, and I know, um, you know, if we if we don't think about that, if we don't really look at the events happening around us, we don't really then we lose our sense of urgency. We need to have that urgency to go and share uh, with people and tell them about uh, to tell to tell them about Jesus. And our next sermon series after this one, we're going to start digging in the book of Acts and look at the early church and look at how it is spread from house to house. And there's so much good. Uh, in that, but there's a verse in Acts 2.42 um, that says the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals and to prayer. Um, and that that verse, um, I'll, I'll let you in on a little secret. That verse is, has really been on our heart as we've been working on our new church building, the, the new outreach community center, because that's really why we're building it. That's why we're preparing it. Um, and according to this verse, the purposes of the church should be teaching biblical doctrine, providing a place of fellowship for believers, observing the Lord's Supper, uh, and praying. And, and so really, when I one of the things I miss most right now is, is kind of two things. It's one, communion and baptism. And those are two activities that we do corporately together as the church that I'm looking forward to. We've got several people now that are waiting to be baptized, and we're going to uh, we're planning a baptism and we don't have a date yet, but if you've not been baptized and 
and you want to celebrate with us as soon as possible, we're going to do that. Uh, we're going to be able to have a, a baptism service, and we're going to figure out a way to do communion as well. We've looked at those little pre-made, pre-packaged communion things, and they're sold out everywhere, so we have to get creative and try to figure out how to, to do that. But um, we, 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 that's part of what a church does. We come together, we remember, and it says as we take communion, we remember the Lord's death until He comes again. And so it reminds us that, that Jesus is coming back. Um, and so I, I just want to kind of, as I think about all of this and, and, and think about everything that we're learning, uh, here's what I, I just think that the church has got to be a, a source of hope. And I know we've got a, a local kind of recovery ministry in town that they've been like tagging stuff on Facebook and all, and they call themselves the hope dealers. And I love that, right? I love that phrase that we're dealers of hope um, because that's really what the, as the church, what we are, we're hope dealers. We, we have hope for the world, a world that desperately needs it. We have the hope that they need. And so that's a great description of what we're doing. We're ministers of hope. So if you're kind of going through life and you're like, what? OK, why? Why is all this happening? You've just got to remind yourself, hey, I'm the hope dealer. I'm the one that needs to be sharing hope with others because I know where my hope comes from. Uh, there's a passage here in Titus chapter 3 that I want to leave you with. Um, and it's, um, it's, an, it's, just a, it's one of my favorite passages because it talks about where we were and where we are. It talks about this journey, this transformation that's taken place in our life from what we once were to where we now are. And I'm going to back up a few verses from where I normally read because this is kind of important too. In Titus 3 and verse 1, it says, remind the believers to submit to the government and its officers. They should be obedient, always ready to do what is good. Now, I know a lot of people are getting a little cranky right now about our government, right? This is a reminder that we're still to be good citizens um, and we're still to do what is good. Uh, they must not slander anyone. They must avoid quarreling. Instead, they should be gentle and show true humility to everyone. And then it goes and talks about this journey, this transformation uh, that's taken place. Um, it says, um, once we too were foolish and disobedient, we were misled, we became slaves to many lusts and pleasures. Our lives were full of evil and envy, and we hated each other. But when God, our Savior, revealed his kindness and love, he saved us, not because of the righteous things he, we had done, but because of his mercy. Uh, he washed away our sins, giving us a new birth and a new life through the Holy Spirit. He generously poured out his, the Spirit upon us through Jesus Christ, our Savior. And because of His grace, He made us right in His sight. He gave us confidence that we will inherit eternal life. And this is a trustworthy saying, and we want, to, we want you to insist on these teachings so that all who trust in God will devote themselves to doing good. These teachings are good and beneficial to everyone. And so when I read that, man, we once were foolish, we once were disobedient, but now we found Jesus and now we have hope. And so my question for you today, do you have that hope? Do you have that hope that no matter what is going on in your life, that you know that Jesus is your Lord, that He's your Savior? I'm so thankful today that we uh, can worship, we can gather together, even if it's right here in our living room. And, and so I, I want to just invite you, do you know Jesus? Do you want to make Him the Lord of your life? Do you want to find this hope that we're talking about? The hope is found in a person, in, a, in God in the flesh who came and lived the perfect life and died on the cross so that we might have everlasting life. And if you don't know Jesus, this is your opportunity right now. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I'm so thankful. I'm thankful for Jesus. I'm thankful for that Jesus loved me so much that He came and lived that perfect life that I could not live. That He went and died on the cross to pay the penalty that I could not pay so that I could be forgiven, so that I could have life in Christ. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful that we have hope. We have hope because You keep Your promises and you've promised, Lord, that you will come again to receive us to yourself, that where you are, we may also be. And so, Lord, I'm looking forward to that day when we get to be with you for all 
of eternity. Heavenly Father, in this craziness and chaotic world we live in, we need hope and you provide that hope. And so, Lord, would you help us to share that with everyone we come into contact with? Lord, we thank you for your blessings. We thank you for your love. We thank you for the opportunities we have now to share Jesus with this world around us. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So this morning, um, we're going to close with a, a hymn. Uh, we thought, man, we're in a, a living room. We've got a piano right here. Uh, why not just open up and and just and close with just an old hymn, just kind of gathered around. And maybe you remember times you gathered around a piano and sang. I want to invite you to, to sing with us. We're going to sing a hymn called It Is Well. And I don't know if you know the, the story behind this, but uh, life can be unpredictable. And this hymn... Uh, it was written by, by a man named Horatio Spafford, and he was struggling in Chicago because of the great fire that happened in 1871, and he sent his family on a vacation to England uh, on the ship over. I mean, they, they had a, a collision. The ship sank. His four daughters died. A tr really tragic story. His, life, his wife actually survived, and when she got to England, she sent a telegram to her husband that she just said, saved alone, what shall I do? He left Chicago, traveled at once for England. At, at the point when they were traveling across the ocean, the captain came to him and said, this is the place where your family lost their life, where your daughters were lost. And, and he sat down and he wrote this hymn. He wrote this hymn. And so it just it's a reminder to us that no matter what's going on around us, we have hope. We can have joy. And so would you join me now for this time of worship? <laughs> 